the Millennium Development Goals galvanise support for poverty reduction. Today, the target of halving the number of people living in extreme poverty has been met. But progress has been uneven. As the United Nations and its partners shape a new global framework to replace the MDGs in 2015, they face the challenge of ending poverty for good, which means tackling some important questions. What is poverty? And how is it measured? Poverty is not only about income, and poor people do not live only in poor countries. Today, a new bottom billion live in middle-income countries, including India and China. It's also not just a question of getting to zero, but staying there. Then there's the issue of where to fix the new development goalposts. To recapture the Millennium Declaration's vision, the new international development agenda must embody principles of solidarity, equality, dignity, and respect for nature. Finally, once these goals have been agreed, how will they be achieved? We'll need new policies and leadership by national governments and the global community. But what else? Tonight, we debate the unfinished business of ending poverty. Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to this a debate, which I'm sure is going to be uh, fascinating. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm delighted to be uh, chairing uh, the event. Um, let me tell you a bit about how the event's going to go. I'm going to introduce our uh, speakers. They're going to say something about themselves, and they're going to identify what they see as being the key question right now in this debate. Um, and then we're going to have uh, three uh, parts to the debate, and I'm going to be bringing the speakers in to discuss the three issues that we are going to discuss over the course of that debate. First of all, we're going to ask, um, what have we achieved so far to end poverty, and how should we understand uh, progress? Then we're going to move on to asking, uh, what do we now know about the policies that tackle uh, poverty? What are the critical lessons that we have learnt? Uh, and then thirdly, I'm going to ask the panel to end the evening uh, by sharing with you how optimistic they feel about the future and what they see as being the critical stumbling blocks, the, stick, uh, the critical barriers to ending extreme poverty by 2030. Now, it's really important for this event that you participate, but it's also very important that you participate in a particular way. So we decided to uh, not have Q&A sessions, which are a little bit kind of predictable, and what we're going to try to do is something different, but it will rely on you playing by the rules, so let me explain what they are. When you've heard something in the debate that you want to respond to, then put your hand up, and I will try and call you as soon as I possibly can, because you've got something to say about that particular point. And then if you have a point to make, please make it really briefly, in a really sharp way, OK? But only make the point at that moment. If I'm not able to call you, don't keep your hand up and then say, well, it's something that was said 10 minutes ago. So I will try and bring you in as quickly as I can, because you've got a point to make, and it's a burning point at this particular moment in the debate. Is that OK? Yeah. Yeah. You're with me? OK. We can make this work. I'm absolutely sure uh, we can make this at work. OK, so uh, you're aware of the issues that we're uh, discussing. Today, the OECD is launching their 2013 Development Cooperation a report entitled Ending Poverty. The report aims to provide leaders with analysis and recommendations on how to end poverty now and beyond 2015. And tonight's event is taking place to coincide with that launch, and uh, we have four expert speakers here and one expert uh, speaker uh, joining us uh, from America to discuss these uh, issues. And there he is. Um, so what I will be doing is I will be introducing the speakers. Hi, homie. Hi. Good. Brilliant. Um, I'll be introducing the speakers in turn, and uh, they'll be telling us a bit about their background, and they'll be pitching what they see as being the key question which is at the front of their mind in this debate right now. So we're going to start with Eric Solheim, who's chair of the OECD Development Assistance Committee and former Minister of the Environment and International Development in Norway. And he has 
Some authority in this debate because during his time as minister, he brought Norwegian aid up to 1% of GDP, making it with Sweden the highest in the world. Uh, Eric, tell us a, more, a little bit more about yourself and tell us what you see as being the burning question. Well, I was for seven years uh, Norwegian Minister of en Environment and Development. I'm now the chair of the OECD Development Committee. I spent 10 years of my life on the ultimately failed peace process in Sri Lanka. And if you want me to point to one success story, I claim to be one of the fathers of the global system to conserve the world rainforests in Brazil, Indonesia, and many other places. Great. And the question that, that is at the front of your mind? Uh, the issue is very simple to me. It's just about mobilizing the political will. For the first time in history, we have all the resources to eradicate absolute poverty. We, we know the policies which work. I mean, it's very different from the kings or emperors of the past. They didn't know how to do it. They have no resources to do it. Now we have all the resources and we know the policies. It's just about mobilizing the political will in the next 10 years, and it will be done. And by 2030, there will be no absolute poor in the world. Very good. Thank you very much. Ahomi Karas is joining us. Uh, he's Deputy Director for the Global Economy and Development Programme at the Brookings Institute. He was most recently appointed lead author and executive director of the Secretariat supporting the UN High Level Panel. Ahomi, tell us more about the High Level Panel and tell us what is the question at the front of your mind. So the high-level panel uh, was a, uh, a relatively uh, uh, short, a uh, nine-month uh, uh, coming together of uh, uh, some uh, very important uh, policymakers from around the world. It was really a little microcosm of the uh, UN. We had people from uh, advanced countries, from uh, uh, poor countries, from middle-income countries, from. Uh, uh, the private business community from uh, uh, civil society organizations academics so a very diverse group of people and the idea was quite simple come up with some uh, uh, suggestions and thoughts about what we should do to uh, uh, follow the mdgs which uh, uh, i think are you know perceived as being something which uh, was really successful in uh, uh, advancing the uh, reduction of poverty i i i would um uh, half agree with uh, uh, Eric's uh, uh, question that all we need now is the uh, political will. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure that we actually do uh, know everything or have all of the resources uh, at our uh, disposal. So I, I would say that the really big question is how do we use this, this forcing moment of uh, you know, post-2015, where all the world's attention is really focused on what do we do next? And how do we use it to say there are ways that we need to change in order to get to scale and impact? I mean, we've done a lot and we've achieved a lot, but if we want to talk about ending poverty, actually, we probably need to do something quite differently. Uh, lots of people have talked about, uh, you know, bending the... Uh, uh, bending the arc of history and uh, things like that. Uh, they're all great slogans. But at the end of the day, it's actually about coming up with a partnership and a means of implementation that is far more effective than anything we've seen today. And that's uh, you know more universal and more comprehensive. Great. Thank you very much, Homie. So uh, uh, the panellists were worrying before we started that they'd all agree with each other. And already we have quite a significant uh, difference of emphasis between political will and, and know-how, which I'm sure we'll pursue as the evening uh, uh, goes on. So uh, now let me introduce uh, Sabina Alkaya, who's director of the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at the University of Oxford. She's also a research associate at Harvard University and vice president of the Human Development and Capability Association. She's also got a fascinating chapter uh, in the OECD report addressing how we could measure the many dimensions <coughs> of poverty. Sabina. We're here to talk about poverty, so I'd like you to picture a poor person who you know. I'll call her Maria. What happens when she wakes up in the morning? She might be worried about her baby's health, maybe thinking about where the work will come from, maybe recalling that, shoot, the roof needs to be fixed, maybe wondering about her time and how she'll get around all the activities she has to do, maybe worried about the long-term future. So my job is to try to take the multiple deprivations that batter pe poor people at the same time and to put them together into a number a number that makes sense to policymakers and geeks, 
but also that tries to communicate the complexity of her reality in a way that it can be addressed as she experiences it together. And the burning question is, how do we do that, technically, rigorously, but in a way that builds on the strengths of Maria, the wisdom and the insight that poor people have, and their own energies, uh, and not just experts? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Priyanti Fernando, Executive Director for the Centre of Poverty Analysis in Colombo, Sri Lanka. She has over 20 years' experience in development in Sri Lanka and overseas, coordinating a global network, leading the country team of an international NGO and working with local uh, NGOs. Priyanti. Yes, um, I, I, I've been working in this business for far too long, I think. But uh, right now, I'm working with uh, the Centre for Poverty Analysis in Sri Lanka. And as an organization, uh, we believe very much that poverty as it exists is an injustice, and that to overcome the injustice, we need to, do, uh, we need to take into account the, uh, the reality that Sabina just explained, but that we also need to take into account the, the, the structures, the structures, the social, economic, and political structures that also keep Maria poor. It's not just, it's not something that only Maria can do something about. It's something that the, everybody else needs to chip in as well. And there are structures in this economic and political structures that keep people in poverty. And it is that that we try to understand, sometimes challenge in our work. Thank you very much. And then finally, last but not least, Jamie Drummond, Executive Director and Head of Global Strategy at the Advocacy Group One. Prior to co-founding One with Bono, Jamie helped to start data and worked for Jubilee 2000, Drop the Debt. Jamie. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so Priyanti was just talking about the economic structures. We try to work with others to campaign to change those economic structures. And uh, back in the day, it was a campaign, Drop the Debt, Jubilee 2000, to get rid of the unpayable debts of the poorest countries in ways that would both enable them to spend more money they used to spend on debt service back into healthcare and education, but also give them the policy space, the, the space to figure out better country-owned strategies that they would see through toward greater poverty reduction. And that was something that was enabled by the early days of the Millennium Goals and the debate around the Millennium Goals. We went on to campaign for antiretrovirals on AIDS, malaria, and so on. And just this week, we're celebrating raising $12 billion uh, for the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, Malaria, a large but still quite young uh, organization that is uh, supported by all of you, um, just as debt cancellation was probably supported by many of you, and Make Poverty History, a campaign in this country and around the world, is supported by many of you, because you pay your taxes and because you support organizations like Comic Relief or Oxfam, and you, you campaign with groups like One, we've made a huge amount of difference. And if there's one thing I just want to get across, before we talk about nuanced complexity, which we need to, and the debate between you know, know-how and political will, it is that you, people have got to know the huge progress that has been achieved. Sure, we haven't hit Nirvana. There's a long way to go. But there's been amazing progress, so thank you. Great. Well, interesting perspectives there. Um, uh, Eric's emphasis on uh, political will. Uh, Homie's emphasis on how do we actually do this on know-how. Uh, Sabina's on the deeper understanding of the experience of those people in extreme poverty. Priyanti's invitation to address the structures that underlie uh, poverty. And Jamie's invitation for us just to understand that we have made progress and possibly use that as the momentum with that we need to believe that we can take uh, the next step. OK, so let's now turn to progress uh, so far. Um, Eric, let me, let me start uh, with you. Uh, what do you think has been done well over the last 15 years? Over the last 15 years, we have seen basically what you could consider the, the rise of the South. Huge number of southern poor nations have, have risen. China is for sure the prime example. They have had 10 percent economic growth since the late 1970s and brought 600 million people out of poverty. In the audience here, we have, I can see a huge delegation from Korea. 
Korea in the 1950s was as poor as any nation in Africa. Today, Korea is well above the European average on green development, on democracy, on social safety net, on economic growth, basically on, on every, every issue. They're even providing us with the Gangnam Style uh, video, which has been <laughs> everywhere on the internet. So we, ha we have seen this tremendous rise. If you ask what is it at the core of this, it's uh, well-led nations who start uh, an economic transformation, uh, economic growth, 10% growth as in China helps, but it's not enough. You also have to have a fair distribution of the, of the growth, and you need to have pr uh, programs directly targeted again towards the very poor. Latin America has shown the way on that. I mean, they have cash-based scheme. Nearly every Latin American nation have a scheme for cash disbursement to the very poor. It helps. Those nations who have targeted the small-scale farmer, trying to I mean, stop the neglect of the small-scale farmer, bring them up. Vietnam is a prime example of that. They have been enormously successful. And Ma uh, Bangladesh and many other nations have been uh, successful in targeting the very, uh, very poor through microcredit. So basically, overall economic growth is at the bottom. You need that, but you also need to reduce inequality and do something for the very poor on that basis. And all this works. Prianti, what do you think has been less successful? If we could go back 15 years and project forward to now, what would we be dismayed that we had made so little progress on? I don't think we need to be dismayed. I think uh, what, uh, what the speakers have said before is actually we have made progress. But I think um, Eric's just said it. We, we haven't really, uh, we may have uh, reduced the number, of, uh, reduced poverty, but we haven't actually uh, reduced inequality. Inequality is on the rise in many countries, and that is that will create a very different kind of dynamic uh, for people who are uh, at the bottom of the of the structures. Uh, we are looking a lot of times when we are looking at um, uh, at poverty figures and the whole reduction in poverty. We are, uh, and uh, I'm sure Sabina will say more about this, but we are looking very much at uh, how. Uh, uh, at consumption poverty or income poverty, we are not looking at all the other um, dimensions that, for instance, the Millennium Declaration asked us to look at. So we looked at, uh, we are not looking at freedom, we are not looking at people's uh, um, uh, equality, we are not looking at um, uh, a lot of the other so uh, non-economic issues, political freedom, etc. We're also, it, those in, that's in terms of outcomes, but if you're also looking in terms of processes, one of the things that has always puzzled me is that we already had some processes. We had the UN conventions on uh, uh, human rights, we had the UN convention on human rights, including social and economic rights, we had all the conventions on, um, uh, on women um, in, uh, reducing inequality, uh, reducing discrimination against women. We had the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Somehow in this whole conversation of getting measurable and uh, uh, quick fixes almost with the MDGs, we seem to have sidelined those, those conventions. And I'm wondering how much, uh, in terms of process, those conventions have actually worked. Well, that, I think, brings us right, directly to you, Sabina, in terms of with your focus on the different dimensions of poverty, what, where do you think we've made progress in these years? And what are the elements of poverty which we've failed really to grapple with properly? If you think back at poverty data, which is in a sense the input to different measures of poverty, in 1984, the World Bank began its first internationally comparable household surveys. In 1994, 95, the two other major surveys began. And so if you think of 15 years ago, we had only data for a few countries, and now we have data for over 135 countries, many for two periods of time. And so the very basic starting point is that now we can say something about how both income consumption poverty and other dimensions of poverty are changing. The data are not enough in frequency or in depth, but we do have some visibility. I think a second change has been the ability and the political will to try to understand different people's experiences of poverty. If you think of the Voices of the Poor study at the year 2000, if you think of the more recent participatory exercises, the Million Voices, the My World, then these are also supplementing numbers 
with qualitative and values of poor people. And then putting this together in, in to measurement, we are able to try to look now at the different deprivations that people experience, how they change, not only at national levels, like the $1.25 a day measure does, but by ethnicity, by household composition, by region of the country, and understand the different things that trap people into deprivation in different ways. And this kind of information, which is just information on measurement, not on the policies or the outcomes that my colleagues have talked about, this has changed, and this perhaps could feed more adequate responses to poverty in the future. Great. Don't forget, uh, audience, I'm ready to bring you in at any time. And, uh, and by the way, if you don't jump in, uh, our online viewers may uh, jump, jump in. Uh, to remind them that our hashtag is hashtag poverty debate. We've got Ashwin Bardwaj sitting in the front row here, ready to take uh, questions from uh, the world outside. So uh, don't, don't wait for them to come in, uh, pose a question. I see, if I was you, I'd be wanting to say by now, isn't the danger that if you have more and more targets that that kind of diffuses public focus, people lose their kind of sense? I don't know, I might be saying that. Um, I'm not saying it though, because it's not my job. I'm just the chair, but I'm just uh, encouraging you to feel a certain boldness. Okay, right, very good. Oh, yeah, oh, very good, sorry, I didn't see you, sir. Make a quick, sharp point, inspire us. And tell us who you are as well. My name is Bob Picciotto. I am at King's College London uh, in the International Development Institute. You know, aid is an important factor in, in poverty reduction. Point, even if you reach 0.7%, it's going to be not the main driver of poverty reduction. Other po global policies, aid, trade, migration, security, intellectual property, have much more impact on what's happening out there since and, and they have resulted in increasing inequality. What is being done in the post-2015 era to fix the global policy framework for poverty reduction? Aid will not do it. Very good, brilliant question. So I'm sure the panel will pick up on that uh, themselves and it'll be part of the debate. So possibly bearing that point in mind, uh, Homie, can we just talk a bit um, about the, the, the goals themselves and whether they were the right uh, goals and whether or not the statistics about the goals help us, given, for example, the degree to which China kind of dominates the overall statistic, for example. Do you think if we could go back, we would have set different goals, should have set different goals? I think that we, uh, you know, uh, learn a lot from the uh, setting of goals. I think that the MDGs, as they were uh, set for uh, global targets, uh, inevitably uh, gave more weight to uh, more populous countries. But if you uh, think about the uh, way in which the goals have been uh, actually used in practice, uh, they've quickly become embedded in uh, you know, national plans and strategies. So, of course, the global numbers are going to be dominated by progress in China and India. But that isn't really the uh, critical number, I think, that we should be looking at. We should be looking at uh, the uh, question of uh, uh, how many countries are actually on track to uh, achieve the uh, goal of, say, uh, halving poverty. And there, I think, the story is uh, actually very dramatic and uh, very heartening. So you have 66 countries, according to the World Bank, that have already achieved uh, NDG1, at least the uh, headline up target of halving, up, uh, halving poverty. Uh, you have another 12 countries that are uh, on track and likely to meet the target by 2015. You've got seven countries that might just miss, but are almost there. And you only have about one quarter that are actually way off track. Uh, and I think that that gives us both a, uh, a sense of uh, uh, optimism about what can be achieved, but also a sense of uh, reality that none of this is going to happen automatically. You know, we have had a global environment in which uh, there's been enormous progress with uh, growth, enormous progress with poverty reduction. We've still had 28 countries where things have actually gotten worse. I mean, in uh, you know places like uh, Zambia or Madagascar, poverty is probably uh, higher today than it was in 1990. So it's uh, it's really important to recognise that both uh, situations are different across countries. 
Situations are different within countries. You've got some uh, uh, regions that uh, lag behind. You've got some communities that uh, lag behind. And uh, uh, so today, I think when we talk about ending poverty, we really have to be much more fine grained. You can't just talk about ending poverty at a global level. And in, in some sense, that's not really the interesting question. The interesting question is, how do we push this into you know, all corners of the world, into all groups, everywhere. And I think that's why in the uh, panel report, at least, there was a very strong message about disaggregating poverty, about moving well beyond country averages. And the beauty of saying we want to end poverty is that it forces you to do just that. It forces you to acknowledge that the average is just what it says. It's an average. And it's great that averages improve, but if there's some specific individuals who aren't keeping up with that average, then those averages don't mean very much. And I think much of this discussion about inequality and what's happening to inequality is simply a uh, desire to move beyond averages and really talk about what's happening to uh, specific people and regions and countries and to all of those who are being left behind. Thank you, Hermie. Now, uh... Uh, um, Jamie, I'm going to bring you in, and I'm particularly interested in you responding to the question that's been put about other things that are affecting this, this picture. But both Sabina and Eric have indicated you want to jump in. Sabina? Very quickly, I really appreciate your comment, Homi, on leaving no one behind and on the importance of disaggregating. But I am worried by trying to look at countries and the percentage of countries on track. Because if you think of the people of Maldives and the people of India, if each country counts for one from a human rights perspective, each life in Maldives or each life in India is worth, has a different value. Each Indian citizen is worth one two thousandth, thousandth the life of a person in Maldives. And so I think we need to balance um, a need to look at small countries and at sub-national regions within countries very much so, but really while keeping the focus on the number of poor people where each person's life counts. Um, and so I think that's not inconsistent with the latter part of the statement, but it does mean going not just counting countries that are on track. I mean, what do you, how do you respond to that? No, I think that's exactly right. I, I was simply, uh, you know, counting the countries, I think, uh, is a, uh, uh, first of all, it's a, uh, uh, the way in which the MDGs were actually implemented. Uh, I think that as we come to a post-2015 era, there will be much more emphasis on all kinds of disaggregation. And I think that, for example, uh, uh, you know, mayors of cities have to buy into these agendas. They're going to be, want to uh, know, how are we doing in our uh, uh, locality? Uh, you're going to have geographic cuts. You're going to have cuts which are based on, uh, 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 on, on, on people's uh, 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 caste or uh, uh, their gender, their age. There are many different ways to look at these uh, uh, numbers and make assessments. Uh, and I think that the idea has to be that we need to be thinking about and developing programs where uh, almost everybody feels they have a stake in the progress of this country. If people don't have a stake in that progress, then it's going to be very difficult to mobilize the resources and the political will, what Eric started with, uh, in order to make this successful. So going, becoming more comprehensive in that way, I think, is actually a, uh, uh, not just something that we do because it's the right thing to do. I think it's something that we do because it's the smart thing to do, and because if we don't do it, it puts in jeopardy the entire enterprise. Eric? I think we must keep both the big and the small picture right. And the big picture is that the world has never, ever been as successful as, as it is today. The average human being is much better fed, much better educated, much better health than at any other point in human history. When I was born, which may be long back, but not that long, uh, average life expectancy on these planets was 46 years. Today, it's 68. I mean, in one generation like that, and it's enormous success. But going to the mother in the Central African Republic, who yesterday saw her two children being killed in the horrendous violence there, with no real hope for the future, and telling her that 
on average, we are much better off on planet, this planet. I mean, for sure, it gives no consolation to that individual. And that's why we need to get this very, very optimistic, broad picture combined with a specific focus on those who are left behind. <coughs> they tend to be women. They're not all women, but they tend to be women. They are very often in ethnic minorities or groups who are marginalized from the top leaders of that state. Uh, and they tend to be living in the countryside rather than in the cities. They're very often small farmers. So we, sh we must both have the big political picture of right political decisions and economic growth, but then also specifically targeted policies to bring uh, uh, with us those who are left behind. Otherwise, it won't work. Jamie, what do you think has, has been the biggest barrier over this period that we have come to, 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 to see and taking up this point? Is it possibly in an area which we hadn't considered to uh, recognise its importance before? Well, I mean, the, the story has changed over the last 15 years uh, in some good ways, uh, in some more nuanced ways. You, I think you raised a point about aid um, and linking to this point about citizens having a stake. When we were campaigning largely in the North for things like debt cancellation and aid, we were, we were campaigning for increased resources from the rich world to the poorer developing world, and it served a purpose. And aid, for example, from sub-Saharan Africa has gone from about 17 to $43 billion in the last 11 years. And most of that has been quite well spent. Um, but the big story is during the same period of time, those same countries in sub-Saharan Africa increased their domestic resources from about $70 billion a year to over $400 billion a year. The key question is what's happening with that money and what can citizens in those countries be armed with through improved millennium goals so that they as citizens have a stake and a scorecard by which they can hold their leaders accountable and the international community accountable so that we go forth and, and, and help them both get themselves out of extreme poverty and transform their economies, as all the surveys show that that is the desire of citizens in these countries. If the goals don't serve the citizens of these countries as that scorecard, they will not succeed. And they must, and it must be focused on that empowerment of people in these countries. We've got to figure out how the international community gets behind that and helps tell that changing story while not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. There's still an important role for aid, for smart aid. And this whole aid debate we can come back to. It's not a monolithic, lumpen thing. There's many different kinds of aid. Some is good, some is less good, some is definitely bad. Um, and we're for the good stuff. Great. Let's take two or three questions around the room. So, Ash, you had one. Um, yeah, I have a question from Sunil Suri, who's coming via Twitter. Um, he talked about the strong correlation between security and poverty. Uh, you mentioned Central African Republic. So perhaps one of the most successful ways to reduce poverty going forward would be to increase security around the world. Should that not be the primary focus in our attempts to reduce poverty? Great. And then there's a gentleman here. My name is Glenn. I work for a charity that takes care of people who live on the streets in Calcutta. Um, I think that uh, we should not be overly self-congratulatory about our progress. We're making it, but there are still hundreds of millions of people who are living on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. We need to remember that. I think our biggest failure in the development goals is women, women's rights are about the same as they were, especially in developing countries. And until we can find a way to get equality, gender equality, uh, using all the political forces that we have, we're going to continue to have poverty. It's not just one of those things among many things that we need to do. In my opinion, it's the most important thing. Okay, and then there's a gentleman there. Hi, yes, my name is Jesu Antonio. I work for ISWOG, an international medical organization here in London. My question is, we talk a lot about uh, the developing nations, but what about the growing poverty that's also happening in the already developed nations, for example, due to crisis? Or is there something going to be done to suppress that from growing any further? Great. And then that. My name is Lisa. Yeah. Yep. My name is Lisa Curtis from DFID. 
Um, I very much take the point that the focus on national averages is now shifting, that we have a far more sophisticated understanding of the fragmentation and the pocketing of poverty in different parts of countries and the subnational level and the different groups being important. My question is this. Now that we have this understanding, do the panelists think that we have the right institutional architecture, both at national level and at multilateral level, to address a very different shape of our understanding of poverty? OK, panel, so some really interesting questions. I'm going to ask you to just leap in and take one of those questions uh, that, that you'd particularly like to respond to. Who's going first? Yeah, Prianti. Just choose one. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to choose one, but I just answer, say something that will probably address a couple. One is that I don't think it's, um, it, I, I agree with the gentleman, I, it's, aid is just one, one factor in this whole thing. And uh, there is also uh, actions of uh, multinationals, uh, uh, governments. There are some things that are lots of elephants in the room that we don't really talk about when we're talking development. Uh, there is within the development sector itself, there are very different uh, uh, power struggles between sectors and people. Um, I've just been in a conversation on uh, transport and how it should feature in the Millennium Development, uh, in the new, new framework. And uh, there's this huge struggle between people who want to give access to rural people and people who are saying, no, it's about sustainable development and that's only about uh, urban transport and, uh, you know, environmentally sound urban transport. So there are lots of struggles, lots of power struggles that uh, that really need to be sorted, that, I don't know whether we can sort them, but that need to be considered. And to just assume that we are going to be able to do this without, without addressing those struggles or doing something with them. And that, those struggles happen at a global level. We just had a seminar where we asked for just governance, and not, not good governance, but just governance, uh, both at the global level and at a local level. And I think that's really important to think about. Eric, do you want to pick up on this point about global institutions and whether or not the institutional uh, picture is, <laughs> is right? I mean, so much change happening. You know, G7, G8, G20, G0, people talk about, are the institutions right for this challenge? I don't think we have the right institutions, but I don't want to spend, I, I think, waste my time in, in trying to change all these institutions. I, I believe a lot more in working on the basis of the institutions which are in existence, because if you want to reform that, you will spend the next 20 years of that with very limited success. The main shift will be the, uh, reflecting the power, power shift in the world. We will see China and many other powers coming into the system in a completely new world way, taking responsibility, being major players. Uh, for sure, India, Brazil, many others. But spending your time designing new institutions, I think you will waste your time. It's, it's not likely to happen. So let's work on the basis of the institutions which are there. They are, they are sufficient to achieve the aim of eradication of absolute poverty. If I may just address the issue of fragile state or, 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 or violence. For sure, one of the absolute biggest services we can do to the world's poor is to stop wars. Because wars is the worst remedy of, of the poor. If there, is no, if there is a war, civil war, terrorism, whatever, no one will invest. No one will construct a school if someone will burn down that school tomorrow. Uh, fortunately, there is less wars in the world, much fewer people are killed in wars than at any other point, eh, probably in human history, for sure, in modern human history. So th also here there is a lot, lot of progress. But we must uh, uh, stop wars in places like Syria, uh, Central African Republic, uh, and some other African nations, if we, S Somalia, if we really want to bring everyone on board for poverty elevation. I mean, Jamie, it seems to me that in, in the debate, for example, the debate that takes place in the UK, this issue of security and conflict, in some senses it's an attempt to understand and empathise with the challenges which people face. It can also sometimes be used as a reason to say, well, why would we spend money on aid and interventions when actually if people just stop killing each other, then they could solve their problems? Well, there's lots of countries which are not in a state of conflict, where there are still entrenched, entrenched extreme poverty, where there's a lot of work to do. 
So, it, you know, it, it, let's bear that in mind. There's lots of places within countries that are largely stable, at least from the outside, which have intra, you know, instability. You know, you take northern Ghana or northern Nigeria. And so, you know, a lot of it uh, is an internal conversation within these countries and a regional conversation. And I, I just want to emphasize that, you know, we need to be careful about the international community coming along and solving every problem, but there are specific moments and opportunities. And when those arise, we have to have the sort of political leadership that's able, able to move. I think, uh, for example, you mentioned Central African Republic. Paul Collier talks in The Bottom Billion about there was a little window of opportunity in around 2003 when, you know, a quick intervention there might have made a significant difference. But, you know, uh, the Anglophone sphere wasn't ready because it's a French-speaking country. The Francophones didn't have their act together. The international community didn't respond. The opportunity was lost. And, and those kind of moments when they arise need to be seized. Uh, some aid resources at that moment would have been helpful had they been applied sensibly as well. So I think all of that matters. A lot of conflicts are also driven over the competition of new resources um, and sometimes scarce resources. And you know, there's a danger in some countries that as they discover huge amounts of oil wealth, the elites will fight with each other to get access to that. Um, and a lot of the work we're doing at the moment that has nothing to do with aid is about transparency in the natural resource sector, especially the extractives, non-renewable extractive sector, oil and gas, and so on. And that's a campaign which is extremely important, which these new millennium goals must assist in sorting out. And if the goals do not have more than the last lot about transparency and accountability and good governance, um, they won't serve the citizens of these countries and the international community that wants to help. Great. Let's just take a final point from the audience before we finish this section of the conversation. Yeah. Um, okay. My name is Lou Graham. I'm a research fellow at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a PhD student at UCL. Um, I think so far the tone has been very optimistic about the progress we've made on the MDGs and the reduction in poverty and in ill health that has happened globally. Uh, what I'm just thinking, and I'm thinking to myself, is that... Self now, just in case you're... Yes, I'm thinking out aloud. <laughs> We're all listening. <laughs> what I'm just thinking is that given the projected rise in average mean temperatures around the world, and that given that all our projection so far is business as usual, no reduction in carbon dioxide emissions, no sign of steering away from global warming, is there a potential that global warming in the next 50 years is going to undo all of the gains we've had so far in development? I think it's a great, I'd be really surprised if that question wasn't picked up in the final question I'm going to ask about people's prospect fears for the future and their prospects the future. And then just finally in this section. Uh, Katie Dane, uh, director of the NCD Alliance. Um, I wanted to pick up on Eric's point on increasing life expectancy. Certainly life expectancy has increased, but now what we're seeing is increasing levels of morbidity in lower middle income countries, and particularly seeing a real surge in non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and cancer and cardiovascular. Um, and these diseases are very much driven by a whole range of issues, things like um, urbanisation, globalisation, uh, trade and commercial interests. So my question to the panel is how can the post-2015 development agenda really tackle and address these really multi-sectoral issues that demand action across all different sectors? Thank you. Sabina, could you briefly respond to that? I'll give a, a very concrete example, and, and somebody in this room I think knows it very well, but so the question is, how do you address multi-sectoral problems? And in a sense, that is a common question across the MDGs, where we need to break the silos. And having a group of people who focus on a problem, a problem that's described multidimensionally, but when they come together and try to coordinate their policies to see how they can work together to address it. So the concrete situation is the government of Colombia, which has a multidimensional poverty index, and associated with that, a committee led by the president with ministers that sits down to look at their 15 indicators and talk about what they have done in the intervening period to reduce each of them and how they could together join efforts to reduce a common goal. And I think that kind, whether it's simply focusing on non-communicable diseases or on different dimensions of poverty, of coordination across sectors focused on a problem can be quite useful, and hopefully measurement tools will support that. So, Sabina, that, it's great that you've made that point, because it takes us right into the next part of the conversation, because what, what we want to talk about now for a while is 
is what are the lessons that we've learned um, in uh, the progress that has been made so far? And I want panel as far as possible for you to get as specific as you can. I'm interested in a particular policy intervention that you've seen that you, when you saw it you thought, wow, that's the thing, or, or that you just you believe in the end is the kind of the killer app, if I might say, in relation to uh, ta tackling this this problem. So, Pranti, let's start start with you. What what have you seen on the ground that's made you kind of think this is it? This is this is what needs to happen. Well, my example of a killer app it sounds a very strange way to say something about okay, Sri Lanka, actually. That app. It's a, it but. <laughs> <laughs> but um, is that in Sri Lanka, actually, we have the MD, the advent of the MDGs uh, really didn't actually make us change our policies. There have, there have been uh, social public policies in Sri Lanka since, uh, since the 1930s and 40s. And if we are now proud of our achievements with the MDGs, it is because of those policies, and they were they were quite contrary to what policies, uh, kind of the policy recommendations that are made in more recent years, because they were universal policies of free health and free education, uh, as well as uh, food subsidies, etc. Uh, they they were for both political reasons and for a um, uh, sense of social responsibility. Governments, irrespective of their inclination or their ideology, and irrespective of whether there was any growth or not, so that it, the policies have been criticized for that, uh, implemented those policies consistently over the last 50 years. And what we are now seeing in Sri Lanka is, is a result of those, a positive result in MDGs, almost achievement of most of the MDGs. Now, the interesting thing is that in recent times, those policies are becoming eroded, and they're becoming eroded uh, because the sense of um, social uh, commitment is much less. Uh, we've also come through a 30-year war, and some of the statistics that show that we have achieved the MDGs don't actually take into account uh, the data from the war-affected areas. So it is likely that in this sort of push towards a consumption-oriented growth, that we would actually um, end up with uh, a worse situation, in a sense, uh, and a bit like uh, what the last uh, question was, with uh, new diseases, obesity, diabetes is on the rise, in, uh, and lots of NCDs, uh, and uh, degradation of the environment, which uh, which will which is not just uh, which is uh, which will also create various other uh, diseases, uh, pollution. You know, there are a whole heap of new new challenges that we would have to face and new ways of, uh, new uh, metrics in a way that we would need to have. Great, thank you. There was a point from the floor. Hello, my name, can you hear me? Yep. My name is Margaret McCabe. I'm the CEO of an organization called Debate Mate. And we work in the world's poorest communities and we train up future leaders. Thank you very much for your, your very interesting contributions. I'm enjoying this a lot. But my point is we work in Nepal, which is an incredibly poor country, and there's a massive amount of aid in Nepal. And obviously there is a big place for aid. But what I've seen as one of the most compelling um, projects on the ground is run by a local Nepalese man. There's very few very, very few Nepalese who actually have been empowered to help their own people. And he has stood up and he has run schools and he's got 28,000 young children, the poorest children in school and in education. And from that, he's training the future leaders and the future community um, leaders. And that I see as incredibly, incredibly powerful. Attached to those huge number of children in school, he's got microfinance for the parents, there's health clinics, and he uses the schools really as a social and central hub. And I think he's probably making a bigger impact than all the policy and the aid that's come into the country for the right reasons. Thank you. Jamie, you talk about smart growth as a, a concept. What, what do you see as the, as the critical poverty levers in relation to that idea of smart growth? Is it linked to empowerment, for example? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, I, absolutely. And I, you, you asked earlier about killer app and power, empowerment, if I can try and combine the two. Um, you know, I think what's exciting us and I think 
some of the people in the room, and you, you know, you know who you are. Um, you know, I can see a few sort of uh, 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 super geeks who are sort of these uh, who, who are crunching the numbers and looking at new data. And the thing is, we have more ability to get more data now, um, and we can know more, though we don't know as much as we'd like. And this information uh, shouldn't just empower us at the Overseas Development Institute or Development Initiatives or one. Um, the exciting thing is when it gets into their hands, the citizens of these countries, and they are able to use it. And that's empowerment, and that's the killer app. And they can get this information now because of the extraordinary development in the last 15 years of mobile So this, this kind of big data movement and that we hear a lot about is, in the UK, is, this know, is I a... I can't really believe we haven't talked about it very much already. And yeah. you know, that's the a transformational piece. We are all uh, religiously opposed to um, silver bullets in the development policy world. Uh, we know they don't work. Um, but <laughs> this one's uh, an interesting bridge into a lot of solutions. It is not a silver bullet but it's, it, it's opening up a world of possibilities which um, can help people access markets, prices, do commerce, but also hold aid accountable, hold their leaders accountable, um, check whether uh, oil companies are behaving well in their, in their area. So it, it's, it's got a lot of potential and something we should talk more about. Very good. Eric keeps trying to catch my eye. I'm worried he's going to leap across the stage and grab me. Eric, I'm bringing you in in a minute, don't worry. Um, OK, very brief points on the floor. Uh, I'm Beck Kapira and I'm a student at UCL. On the point of empowerment, do you feel that empowerment should also happen on an international global level rather than just sort of this, this national level? Do you not feel that we need some sort of global economic restructuring as well to balance out these inequalities that sort of hinder the rise of the global south? Okay, yes. uh, 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 homie, uh, 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 did you hear that question, homie? Yes, I did. Yeah, okay, I'm going to come to you in a minute. So can you kind of hold that question for... for, for but, Sabina, before we go to Homi, can you... You, you describe poverty in, as, as this co complex, multi-dimensional phenomenon. What intervention, particular interventions, have you seen that are m the most holistic in terms of their effect? In a sense, because poverty is complex, it is common across many countries that have made very good progress in accelerating reduction of Millennium Development Goals that they recognize the synergies in coordination across different sectors, different programs. So to give an, a couple concrete examples, the Village Development Program in China, where there is a menu of different things, there's a, and a community, in a sense, in a two-year period, obtains a menu of interventions. That's one of the policies China's putting out in their poverty priority areas to try to reduce rural poverty. Another example from a very different political setting is in the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil, where again, they have an integrated development program, I can never pronounce it correctly, but something like Traesia, um, where they have six different interventions that they would do sequentially on communities according to the composition of the poverty and the input from those communities and the local leadership. And so some would be for health or for education or for credit or savings, some would be for housing, some might be for uh, community spaces for gathering and, and group participation. But I think looking across them is a common feature of some kinds of success, particularly at more local levels. Great. Uh I mean, we, I, I'm particularly interested in what you think we ought to learn. Sabina mentioned China from the Chinese success story, but can you also comment on this question about the global balance of power and how, how important that will be, uh, has been and will be? I, first, if I can just uh, 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 talk a bit about uh, China and other middle-income uh, countries. Uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the the, the key lesson from all of those experiences is that you get real economic transformation and development when you're able to do things at scale. Uh, interventions have to be, uh, they have to be national. They have to uh, really change almost every aspect of, uh, uh, of your country. And, you know, many of the examples that people have just given, I would say, are examples of things uh, uh, moving at scale. Information is the classic thing. Uh, it's only really useful 
if it's available to everyone, if everybody has uh, uh, equal access to information and can be empowered and can join the mass movement. China, of course, is the, uh, you know, the uh, absolute, uh, uh, almost a caricature of a country that's been able to scale up its uh, uh, programs uh, in an extraordinary fashion. And whether those are uh, uh, programs at the community level or whether it's uh, big programs on uh, infrastructure, once they actually uh, implement a program, they do it and they take it to scale. I, 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 I feel that we shouldn't how, forget sorry, homie, can what I, I just thought, Homie, can I just interrupt? How do we reconcile that point about the need to do things nationally at scale, which rather implies a kind of quite centralising approach, which might mean riding roughshod, for example, over local opinions and local variations with the points that we've heard from other panellists about the importance of kind of bottom-up empowerment? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, scale means that the national government has to uh, implement it. Look at the thing that's probably changed uh, the landscape of Kenya most completely in uh, recent years, which is the introduction of mobile money. Uh, you know, that has generated a uh, platform for all kinds of uh, different approaches. It's not something that the government planned. In fact, it probably only went to scale because, precisely because the government didn't plan or regulate it. But it was an absolutely transformational thing because today every single Kenyan has access to financial services. Well, there are still, you know, well over a billion people in the world that don't have access to financial services. Uh, there are one and a half billion that don't have access to power. Uh, we shouldn't forget the big issues of infrastructure, of access to services, uh, and in. Some, some instances, those will be delivered by uh, governments. In some instances, they won't. In the area of telecoms, they're not being delivered by government. In the area of uh, uh, many uh, even health and education services in a uh, country like Bangladesh, they're actually being delivered by uh, uh, quite large now uh, uh, non-government organizations like uh, BRAC. But the key to the successes there are their ability to take it to scale. When Bangladesh's uh, people ask, why is it that Bangladesh, which was uh, in many ways seen as being the, uh, 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 the, the, the region of the subcontinent with some of the worst prospects in uh, 1971 when it came into being, why have they managed to uh, 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 make as dramatic progress as they have? Lots of people say it's basically because of the extraordinary commitment they have to women's rights in a variety of different areas. That was something that was implemented really across the country. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, I think, uh, probably uh, driven the tremendous achievements that they've had in uh, bringing down uh, uh, child mortality, increasing life expectancy, increasing enrollment of, uh, 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 of uh, girls in schools. Um, Very briefly, so can you pick I, up I, on this point about the kind of geopolitical balance? So I, 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 I think it comes to that because there is always this balance uh, uh, internationally uh, between wanting to be uh, much more inclusive uh, of uh, uh, voices, of uh, wanting to recognize the, um, uh, the, the differences of opinions that uh, exist around the world, which are uh, uh, driven by differences in local contexts. So, of course, people have different uh, uh, opinions. But on the other hand, what the international community can do is really try to help some things move to scale. And so what you're trying to do to some extent at the international level is figure out how can we mobilize resources, how can we mobilize technology, how can we mobilize information systems, how can we do all of this uh, uh, on a scale where experiences in one country then feed over and help other countries learn. All of the expansion of, say, safety net programs that we've seen spreading from Latin America to the rest of the world has happened through international organizations uh, uh, because that is the platform where, uh, 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 where these things can be spread from uh, country to uh, country. So I think it's really important to give more countries uh, what's, you know, voice and say so that they can share these experiences where they've been, uh, uh, been so successful. Great, thank you very much. Eric, I'm bringing you in, in a one moment, but I've just got two very short points from the floor. Very brief points before it comes in. Yep. 
uh, I would very much like to join what Jamie said, that a killer replication might be something to give people information about transparency so that we give empowerment if we raise information to the level which people would understand. And I would just like to add one thing. When we go through the data revolution, when we go to the transparency revolution, there are still, when we have data, there is still a possibility that we improve the knowledge how people will understand by an innovation of method which makes people very easily understand those things which data are saying. And this is something which we can do with a time distance we, uh, people would understand that very easily whether you are ahead or behind the line to target. Uh, it's, you know, something which everybody understands, but the point is what Jamie made. And this is empower people to understand and therefore also influence the decisions. Thank you. And then here. Um, so back to the point about um, doing things at big scale. And if you notice that most countries with mass poverty, actually countries with large corruptions, with um, government doing things in large scale, such as China, and um, it means government planning big projects. And with a large um, scale of corruption in, in those governments, I actually question how the effect effectiveness of um, the government doing projects in big scale to um, end poverty. OK, thank you for that point. Uh, Eric, I don't know whether you want to respond to either of those points, but I know there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of stuff that you want to come in on. There, there is such a lot, but if, if you ask what, what is the common denominator, what's, what's the silver bullet, I think it's getting the big political decisions right. That's what really distinguished those success stories. I mean, if you look to China, it was Deng Xiaoping. He was not, he was not empowered. He grabbed the power. Uh, and it transformed, uh, transformed China. It started in, we can, we can pinpoint the moment, it started in November, December 1978. And from that on, China was completely transformed. Nepal was mentioned here, it's one of the most successful peace processes anywhere in the world. That huge difficulties, but on that point, I've done everything right. And it's an astonishing example any nation uh, could learn from when it comes to peace processes. Korea is here. If you look to the one point on planet Earth where there's the biggest difference in a small place, it's in Korea. South Korea, a fantastic success story on every account. North Korea, one of the poorest nations on Earth. There's two hours from Seoul to Pyongyang. You, you could bicycle between the two capitals if, that, if, if the border was open. What's the difference? Just the difference between right and wrong political decisions. Same religion. Same culture, same language, same everything, except the political decisions. And if you, I mean, you can continue, Turkey tripled its GDP per capita in the last, uh, last 10 years, and they made the right political decision. Latin America, by and large, making right decisions. What is it that leads <laughs> politicians to make the right decisions? Is this just a matter of luck? <laughs> I mean, by, you know, by the way, if we knew, it would be quite useful for us to know here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's for sure these dynamics of bottom-up and, and top-down. Good politicians can make an enormous difference simply by the individual... Indiv well, where indiv was the bottom-up in China? Uh, uh, there is a huge bottom-up in China. I, I mean, tr I mean the, the Chinese people demanding change. I mean, they were fed up with the Gang of Four. I mean, it was enormously popular in China. Uh, when, when Deng Xiaoping took the power and put it on, a, on a, another track. And today, I mean, the, if, you, if you speak the, to the middle class in China, they're putting an enormous pressure on the communist part of China to change its environmental pol policies, because pollution is so enormous, I mean, the point made by the, by the person up there. So there is enormous bottom-up in China as well. And this the bottom-up and top-down, that, that's when you get the and, right... And, do you, and do, you agree, uh, do you agree with this point about the Jamie's point that was echoed over there about that data could be part of what releases this bottom-up energy, that when people at the bottom understand more how money's being spent and what's happening with it, that this could be one of those uh, benign impulses? Eric? Sorry, I couldn't follow. Oh. I, I thought you were giving the floor to that person. Sorry. It's fine. Jamie, why don't you pick up on that? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, because it was your point, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're very Jamie, do you agree with yourself? Uh, but can I just, we maybe elaborate? 
Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We're talking about the generation Very brief. I mean, yeah, look, uh, uh, you asked earlier about global economic structures. We're taking on right now with a coalition of other organizations the biggest and most powerful political lobby in the world, right, which is the petroleum and oil and gas sector. And they don't agree with everything that we would like. And whether or not we succeed with our partners in this campaign depends upon you and everyone else in this room and others like you joining these campaigns, which is your choice. You don't have to. Now, we will have, I hope, intelligent, sensible, evidence-based policy which we'll present all day long to people who will listen in decision-making circles. But if you don't support these campaigns, they won't have popular legitimacy, they won't be sustainable, they won't win. So yes, political will matters, and it is up to you. It is up to you to look at the data sets, decide what you think is right, and then join these campaigns or not. Um, and that's how policies get changed. I'm not saying that's what happened in China, but we have the opportunity in more and more countries where there is relatively more open governance than there was 15 years ago because of the end of the Cold War and so on, um, to make those changes happen. But they won't happen if you don't join these campaigns. OK, we're going to do three or four things before we finish this, this part of the conversation. So we're going to hear from Prianti. Yeah, my we're going to hear from the gentleman there. Uh, we're going to hear from the gentleman there. And then I'm going to bring in Jon Lemoy, who's Development Director at OECD, who I think is going to talk particularly about smart aid as silver bullet killer out. Do we, maybe we need an, an, <laughs> another less aggressive metaphor. I don't know. Uh, OK. OK, very quickly, I think the uh, in, Right to Information Act in, in India, for example, has made a huge difference uh, uh, in facilitating a, certain, a lot of bottom-up change. Uh, Indian bureaucrats don't really like it because they have to be much more accountable, but it has actually made a big difference. But I'm still thinking we're still skirting the global governance conversation, uh, conversation that somebody also brought up. I mean, we talked about security earlier, and we tended to talk about national wars. But it's not only national wars. It's the people don't fight for petroleum, just the elites of Nigeria. You know, the petroleum is fought out in, for a, in a global scale. So I think there is something about global governance that we really need to think about. And maybe that's something you'll return to in your, in your final comment about the key determinants of the likelihood of success. OK. Yeah, quickly. Thank you. Uh, my name is V. Sharma. I, I don't work in the sector, um, but I'm thoroughly embroiled in it because I live in a globalized world. Um, I think the point speaks directly to what, what Jamie and the gentleman right here were saying. We hear, we, obviously, we hear the success stories, and it's great not to be encountered by yet another barrage of poverty porn. What I'm interested in is you talk about you know, these, these particular campaigns. We talk about changing the global structures, um, and yet, the only instances in which I, I, I encounter po poverty reduction in the West is, is, is largely the, the story around aid. And I'm talking about media here. So what in our schools is talking about things like migration, like trade, like uh, unequal globalization? You know, we talk about you know, dishing out the money, if you will, and t you know, teaching young kids to be more generous. I think we have to teach our younger kids to be more aware. You know, it, it constantly reminds me of this quote from Bombeck and the similarities between the poverty movement and the feminist movement are uncanny, where she says, you know, I, we, we now have this generation of women with their three-piece suits and attache cases, and they think gender equality has been achieved. You know, and it's a very similar piece where we think in the West, you know, that, that, that progress along the MDGs has made, you know, is, is, is of consequence. When, when our educational systems don't engender the kind of broader awareness that we need around these issues. And I'm just curious as to how far will this battle go without a deeper understanding of, of, of those complexities at, at, from a very young age? OK, thank you. Uh, Ash, you've got a very short point, because it might come in more than 140 characters. Uh, definitely not. Uh, I'll just speak loudly. Jo yeah, shout, um, shout. So paraphrasing a question from Peter Kopp. We, uh... You've talked about China's um, growth and the way they've reduced inequality there. Um, and we've seen growing inequality in Western nations. So is it the case that democracy gets in the way of reducing poverty? That's, what, what a great question to raise with 17 minutes to go. OK, um, uh, but we will, we'll, we'll try and come back to it, yeah. Thanks very much, Andrew Shepard, uh, ODI, and uh, the Chronic Poverty Advisory Network. Um, I just wanted to congratulate Eric Speak on... Speak into the mic, sorry. Oh, am I... it, no, if you're just waving it around. OK, um, OK. 
I just wanted to congratulate Eric on hammering home on this political issue, and I think the question about democracy is, is really important too. Um, in well, looking you, at... Could you just answer it for us, then? N well, OK, in a minute. All right. In, in, <laughs> in looking at... In identifying in um, middle-income countries which have been successful in terms of... most successful in terms of leaving no-one behind, um, you, can, you can do a political analysis of that question. And what does it produce? It produces uh, left-of-center democratic governments in Latin America and so on, um, possibly South Asia a little bit. Uh, it produces communist regimes, which are very keen on growth, but also have an eye to political stability and uh, want to achieve that through progressive policies. And it produces regimes which are based in marginalized constituencies, so ethnic minorities which have been discriminated against, which somehow managed to get into power. It's those kind of regimes which often have the most comprehensive to achieve Sabina's synergies among the sectors and policies, the most comprehensive uh, good outcomes in the end of the day. So I think thinking about politics of it, the politics of this is really important, but it's a, it's a ter terribly difficult issue to do at the international level. This is all down to national issues. Thank you very much. Uh, Jan Lemoy, Director of the OECD. Um, uh, 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 development Director of the OECD. Just your thoughts in terms of the key policy challenge. I think, as I say, particularly interested in the notion of smart aid. I mean, we just had a kind of critique of an emphasis on aid as well. So, uh, Overall, I think... Is it work yeah, it's working. Uh, overall, I think we, we need to keep two thoughts in our mind at the same time. On the one hand, the enormously good news that overall development financing has increased dramatically than other sources than aid has increased much more than aid. Therefore, the relative importance of aid has decreased in a decade where aid has increased more than ever before. That's, that's, very, that's very good news. On the other hand, we mustn't use that to talk down aid because there is a risk when we talk about it, sort of its reduced importance that we belittle it. And, and I think the, the other thing we need to keep is 130 billion US dollars per year. That's what our taxpayers is prepared to, to give to the poor world in concessional financing. How can we use it smarter in this as one of many sources of funding? I think, one, we can use more of it where it's most needed. The, 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 the most difficult news in the last year's aid statistics wasn't the marginal reduction in the overall level, but actually the reduction in volumes to the countries that need, is, need it most, the least developed countries, countries coming out of conflict. So that, that's one important message. The other one is, is fairly boring. Sometimes if it, if it isn't new, it isn't important. But sometimes old news are very important. We learned some lessons in Paris, in Accra, in Busan about what made make aid works. It's about focus on results. It's about respecting countries' leadership. It's about using their plans. It's about using their systems. It's about untying. It's not particularly exciting, not new, but it works. And then thirdly, it is about how can we use a share of these 130 billion to mobilize other sources of funding? How can we invest more in, in tax? We can, how can we get a, a sort of supplement? If we, if we invest it as much in the new tax inspectors without, without borders as we've invested in Médecins Sans Frontières, we would make a few billions. How can we use a share of those 130 billion to reduce the risks so that private commercial in, and other commercial investors can help Africa unlock its infrastructure problems? And how can we also use a share of it to uh, help con poor countries get back some of the tens of billions of, country of, of dollars that flow illegally out of those countries? And lastly, how can we help it to stimulate exchange of ideas between countries? Great. Thank you so much for that, Jan. Right, now, panel, um, I'm taking two or three points on the floor, and then I'm coming to you for your final contribution. So just while you're preparing yourself, um, it, it's your chance to say whatever it is you most want to leave in the audience's mind. But in particular, I want you to ask the, answer these two questions in your own way, which is, are you confident that we can, extend, we can end extreme poverty by 2030? And what do you see as being the most critical factor? Because I was asked before, you know, were you confident? I, they won't say yes or no, they'll say it depends. So I want to know what, what, what hangs on it depends 
uh, for you. So I'm going to come to you in a minute, but first of all, I'm going to take a point from here. And then, I, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Claire Malamid from the Overseas Development Institute. We've been a lot of talk this evening about politics and the role of governments, um, but really what we've talked about is the role of politics and governments in delivering other things. So how, whether, how, the extent to which having a good government can help to deliver good healthcare, good education, reduction in income poverty. But I think in terms of defining poverty and the kind of changes that we want to achieve, we have to keep sight of the fact that Actually, for many people, having a government that treats you fairly, that you can be confident about being treated with dignity and respect by public authorities, is actually an, a sort of objective in its own right. Sabina mentioned the My World survey that we, um, we run with a number of UN agencies. We've had 1.26 million responses from around the world to the question asking people what are the things that they most want for themselves and their families. And an honest and responsive government is fourth. And that holds true for different groups of people in different countries, different parts of the world. Um, you know, this is something that people value in its own right, not just as a way of getting other things. Very interesting point. So good governance isn't just a means to an end, it is an, uh, an end in itself. Yep. Two more really brief points from the floor. Yep. Hi. Um, my name's Fran. I also uh, work for Debate Mate. And maybe um, that's uh, why I'm asking this question, because I'm biased, but I'm surprised um, how little there has been talk of education and um, whether that's actually the more of the determining metric for reducing extreme poverty than, say, democracy. And actually, it's only through education that you then empower people to later on kind of give them a voice and you, you train up those leaders so that they can then help instill democratic institutions and they can have rights and so on. But actually, they're never going to be able to get up to that. There's no use having the rights if you then you know, you don't have the, the, the education and the knowledge to be able to kind of push those further and do something with it. And I think it's interesting when you talked about South Korea as an example, but you failed to mention they've also, one of the reasons they're so successful is they have the best education, they have the best teachers in the world. And that's why now China, you know, Shanghai was top of the, the, the ratings, they're overtaking America. China doesn't have, you know, has very little democracy, but it has really, really good education, which is why people are coming out of poverty. And other programs in Brazil, the Bolsa, okay. oh, you've made the point. really you've, you've successful. You've made the point really well. Um, it always happens at this point in the evening when all the hands go up, uh, because you all know we've got eight minutes to go and you want to see how I cope. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll have the woman right at the back there who's going to make a point that's going to last less than 30 seconds. I'll try. Oh. Um, this, this goes a little bit to the point earlier made about um, the struggle within development space um, and the power struggle. Um, I work for an organization that's focused on job creation, uh, which has seen a bit more um, headline in the fight against poverty, poverty recently. Um, I, I find it surprising that we haven't talked about jobs. Um, but to that, I was also just wondering um, if, I could get, if we could get a few points on, from the panel on private sector and, and their role in this fight and the importance of their role. OK, um, and then there's a gentleman there. Yeah, thank you. I'm Juan Manuel Uribe, Embassy of Colombia. Um, much has been said about being uh, uh, ending poverty. I would like to ask uh, the, uh, the speakers uh, the other way around, and that's what should we understand by not being poor? What is that we do really want to achieve with ending poverty? OK, now I'm going to make myself incredibly unpopular and not take any more questions, even though there's a forest of hands out there. I can tell you that you're going to, you can pick up a copy of this report when you leave at the end of the evening, and this report addresses many of the questions that have been raised, even if the panel don't themselves have time to do so. So, panel, your final kind of submission, starting with your confidence for whether or not we can end extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, Prianti, starting with you. Oh, um, I think we can end extreme poverty, or we should be able to, as uh, Eric pointed out, this is the point in time where we have the resources. My question is why, whether we will, and that is because I'm not sure that the people who are responsible for the use of those resources in totality are, are actually using them in a way that is equitable and that is also working within the natural limits uh, of, of this planet. Uh, we haven't talked about that here at all. Um, and I, I worry about that too. 
So I think we haven't talked about the various interest groups. We talked about tax. Uh, the Christian Aid has a campaign for tax justice, which actually uh, is talking about multinationals not paying tax in the countries that they extract, uh, they work in, and that is uh, also strapping governments in those countries. So there, there's this whole sort of interest groups and power structures in the world that needs to deal with the, with the distribution of resources in a more equitable way and in a more natural, uh, and in taking into account the natural limits of this planet, uh, if we are actually to end poverty. Uh, end poverty as we see, know it now, and end and make sure that nobody gets left behind in the future as well. So, yes, but we have to focus on power and on justice and on sustainability throughout this process. Is that a reasonable summary? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. No, I'm going to try and do that for everybody. I, I shouldn't have done that. Right, Eric. No, I mean, the answer is for sure we can. There is absolutely no doubt that we can eradicate absolute poverty by 2030. We have all the resources. I mean, the money needed for this is absolute minusculous. I mean, it's the, the economic growth from now to the 1st of January well, is enough. Stop, what could stop us? Like? Uh, what, what the, the one issue which can stop us is that we are not able to mobilize the sufficient political will of the top actors if we keep too many wars, if we don't really focus on education, as the lady over there said, we, we, we can miss this opportunity. But we have the chance. Latin America is well on track. East Asia is well on track. There are two remaining big areas for absolute poverty, is Africa and South Asia. But there is also huge progress there. The biggest difficulty, which we have not really discussed, is what the gentleman over there said. This must be done within the planetary limits. We cannot remove poverty while at the same time increasing climate change uh, uh, and, uh, and, do, uh, and do huge harm to biodiversity. But again, this is solvable. Many nations do it. Brazil, to just give that, that one example, Brazil has reduced the deforestation rate in the Amazon with 80%. In the same period, as they brought tens of millions of people out of poverty, have beautiful investment climate for business, that has simply got the political decisions right, by and large, both on the environment and on development. And there are a huge number of other examples, but we must bring environment and development together. And uh, to me, we should adopt the most beautiful of all political slogans, which is Nike, just do it. Very good. <laughs> OK, so uh, from Eric, I hear, yes, uh, I hear another slogan, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, as long as we get the policy right and we have the political leadership that we need. OK. Right, Jamie. Um, of course we can, but we won't, unless um, this debate gets out on the street um, in a way that it has not. And that is something that we've got to pay a lot of attention to in the next couple of years. It is absolutely right and appropriate that we have very pedantic conversations with Homie and the gang. Um, and uh, that conversation must go on. But we've also got to get better at the communication of this extremely nuanced debate and, uh, and take the argument to the streets. There's going to need to be campaigns and chapters in every country and then connections between them around the world so that we have an informed global citizenry who are better organized than ever before forcing the political will to be generated. Without it, it won't be. And that's an urgent task that also um, can be improved by looking at data. We know a lot about what makes effective campaigning. We know about a lot about what generates political will, actually. Um, we also just need to do that. Um, but right now, we're not set to do it. We're in a moment of extraordinary opportunity and jeopardy. And we might just miss that opportunity to bend the arc of history that you were talking about earlier. Um, please don't let that happen. What happens next is, is up to you. So Jamie is saying we can do it, but only if we recognize it's up to us to do it, not there's to a, leave it to somebody there's else. There's sort of a war within each one of us, which is between you know, apathy and the call to action. You know, it's, it's easier to read the Daily Mail or watch the X Factor or play a video game um, and, and listen to the data sets that say there is no progress, every African leader is corrupt, all aid is wasted. Those data sets are out there and they need to be challenged, scrutinized and rejected. 
um, because there's a lot of evidence about what works. We need to scale that up um, and double down on those things. And keep innovating, being entrepreneurial, both in the policy and in the activism to improve that policy. Great. Can I, can I just say I object strongly to the moral equivalence of watching X Factor and reading the Daily Mail? Um, uh, <laughs> What I do on my Saturday night is up to me. Uh, OK. Uh, Actually, no, 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 it's both fine. Of them, made the both point. of them can, are the part of the, you know, the X Factor and the people I mean, on why it. Why do you want to help generate the political of us, will? You know? The um, Daily Mail could help generate the political will. It's up good. to them. Very good. Sabina. So Matthew Taylor talked about ending extreme poverty and Eric about ending absolute poverty. But what are these? How will we know if we have won? And how will people know if they have won? And in a sense, the World Bank talks about $1.25 a day poverty and ending that. And I don't think that that would be a true success. Our group uh, also generate a sister measure to a monetary poverty measure. We look at the joint deprivations that batter people's lives at the same time, things like malnutrition, losing a child, uh, not having an education, not having clean water, sanitation, electricity, assets. But we could add to that violence. We could add to that livelihoods. And the question is, could we look at people who suffer these multiple deprivations at the same time and end their situations alongside $1.25 a day poverty? And I believe the answer to that slightly re reworded question is yes. To give an example of Nepal with work with Jose Manuel Roche, we looked at reductions in Nepal from the time of the peace agreements in 20 2006 to 2011. Poverty in Nepal reduced from 64% to 44%. 20% of the population in a mere five years. At that time, one of those years, there was no government. Many of those innovations were returning migrants in their 40s or 50s doing grassroots work. Some was social protection and social expenditure. So they're complex stories, but even in that circumstance, if such progress can be made, I think it's possible. But I think it means defining poverty in a way that makes sense to many different layers of actors and aiming at the right thing. So from you I hear, Sabina, yes, we can, but we have to do it in a way which recognises the full nature of poverty and engages those people in poverty at the heart of the change process. Is, is that a fair summary? Mm -hmm. OK, the best I can do. <laughs> uh, Homie, finally, from you, uh, are you confident and critical variable for you, critical factor? Confident, no, hopeful, yes. Uh, critical factors, uh, I think that... Uh, if we continue to think of poverty as something that uh, uh, is uh, an endeavor by uh, uh, people in uh, relatively rich countries to help people in relatively uh, poor countries, it will fail. Uh, countries have to do much more to put their own house in order. We have to recognize that we're living in an interconnected word, world and that the uh, that the, uh, the agenda to end poverty is not an agenda just to a moral agenda to do something good for people living halfway around the world. The agenda to end poverty is actually a part and parcel of a much broader agenda, which is on moving forward with sustainable development in a way that no country has achieved as yet. And if we don't have those conversations about what is sustainable development and start to apply that to development more broadly, we will not end poverty. Second, I think if we can't get the private business community really seriously interested in the opportunities that are uh, there for sustainable development, none of this will happen. The resources to end poverty will by and large come from uh, uh, private businesses investing in countries and generating jobs. Uh, jobs came up earlier from the uh, floor. If there are no jobs, there is no end to uh, poverty. This is what will make the end of poverty actually uh, uh, sustainable over time. And then finally, I would say we still t tend to wait until it's far too late to act. We see that when it comes to wars. Uh, we wait until there's actual violence before intervening. The same is true with many, many other things that uh, uh, affect the lives of poor people. If we wait until we see the worst aspects of deprivation and only then are motivated to actually get out and, uh, and act, we won't be able to end poverty. We have to act now, we have to act with a sense of urgency, and we have to act with a sense of purpose. 
all of that starts with really getting the world to agree on a post-2015 agenda. Some people are already taking it for granted that that will happen. Uh, I think that shouldn't be taken for granted. We need to have an ambitious and consensus-based post-2015 agenda. I mean, thank you very much for that. Well, uh, thank you all. We've really scratched the surface of many of these issues, but it's been a fascinating debate. My sense is that there are all sorts of interesting and subtle differences of emphasis between our panellists, but there is a lot more that unites them than separates them. Um, uh, I'm going to remind you that you can get a copy of this uh, extremely good report. I was reading it earlier. It's, it's very powerful. It's also it's very readable. So grab that on your uh, way out. Report from the OECD and who, who've supported this event. And thank you to Intelligence Squared for the event as well. Um, I'm going to ask you to combine two things now. I'm going to ask you to combine your thanks uh, to Eric Solka uh, Solheim, to Sabina Alkaya, to uh, Prianti Fernando, to Jamie Drummond, and to Homi Karas. And I'm also going to ask you, in thanking them, to make the, the, the strength of your applause an indication of your own personal commitment to end uh, extreme <laughs> poverty by 2030. It's over to you.